in today's LA Times is um, <laughs> this letter to the editor. Thanks, Internet. Um, this was in response to an editorial of a few days ago, the decline of our discourse. When personal computers and the internet became ubiquitous, civility was dealt a final blow. I want your reaction to this, whether it's true or not. And some of, the, some of my attitude has changed by our discussion from this morning. It's so easy to be nasty and cruel sitting at a keyboard, never seeing what impact the nastiness and vulgarity are having on the recipients of such missives. When families stopped having at least dinner together at the same time and at the same table, simple manners stopped being taught. Ordinary courtesies like, quote, please and thank you seem not to have been taught in years. The art and grace of communication are dead. It was said decades ago that, quote, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, great minds discuss ideas, unquote. Modernly, as the New Yorker cartoon put it, quote, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So, yes, I get where she's saying that the Internet seems to have lowered the bar for civility. Um, I wonder, however, if a longer view of history mm -hmm. may uh, dampen some of that. I mean, part, part of this is, you know, get off my lawn, you kids, type of thing, thinking. Because I, I wonder if people would have said the same thing about the telephone. Like, now you can yell at people over the phone rather than in person. And, and, you know, you don't even have to go over there to do whatever. And maybe even before that, um, the telegraph, like what kinds of things could you do? You could send a telegram to announce the bad news rather than showing up in person and saying it. Um, that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the histories of those particular communications well enough to know, but I do suspect that there were some changes and some negative sides to those kinds of things. And it is interesting to sort of think about in the history of the way that we have communicated with each other, where have the big changes come? And there's some argument to say that the biggest change came with the development of the telegraph because before that time, the fastest way to get any communication from one place to another was to write it out and hand carry it on a horse, you know, 30 miles per hour. And that was, that was true for 2,000 years or, or longer until the invention of uh, electronic communication. So. All that to say, she's probably right, but it's probably not new. <laughs> I think uh, I think there's a, a lot of truth to what you say. In fact, in fact, I really like the point about taking a longer view about historical context because I think there's uh, a tendency to look at our cultural moments right now in the information age and immediately look at the internet as a causal phenomenon for every social ill and conversely every social good. And I think we need to stop, back that up a bit and say, okay, wait a minute. The internet, um, one, was a long time developing. I mean, when was the first email sent? Like 1972 or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, so all that technology was developing over time at the same time in parallel to other cultural trends. And so I think it is helpful to take a longer historical view at how our society and culture have been developing and changing and see the internet as, yes, a major influencer in that, but as a, as a thing that would actually cause an actual new ethic to emerge. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not so sure about that, especially one so rapidly. Um, here, here's something I've been thinking about quite a bit as uh, we've had these discussions about cultural shifts and uh, changes in communication. Uh, there's a uh, academic, I, I want to say she writes from Yale, I just, I, but I'm not entirely sure, so don't quote me on that. Her name's Selah Ben Habib, and she wrote this fantastic book called Claims of Culture. And in this book, uh, one of the things she points out is that um, culture is not this monolithic thing. Uh, we like to think it's a monolithic thing, but in a lot of ways, cultures, whether it's subcultures or national cultural groupings, whatever, are usually in flux quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And when those cultures are in flux, what you usually see is uh, social uh, changes or social conflicts between groups are usually where edges of cultural groups are expanding, contracting, moving, are, are those influx edges of cultures bumping up against each other. And in a multiracial, multicultural society like America, when I look online and see all these cross-cutting cultural groups, 
uh, interacting with one another, I kind of sit there and say, yeah, I wish there would be a more civil way of discussing differences and changes, but in a lot of ways, what I'm seeing is culture in flux, culture changing. It just, what used to be something that was mediated through, I guess, slower technologies like um, print paper, uh, print books, or just in, you know, when a new family moved into the neighborhood, um, is now mediated en masse on this um, on these social platforms and it's it's beauty but also its ugly side is there for all to see and I think that's what we see more often than not I don't know if it's a death of civility I think what we're seeing are you know rub edges of cultures rubbing up against one another and trying to understand one another communicate both at the individual level and at the community level very good point we've always had the most horrific things about our human nature mm -hmm. way before technology or mm -hmm. Pony Express or whatever. Yeah. Gossip, you know, bitterness, hatred, backbiting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, murder. But let me ask you this. Is there something about the digital age that has, as I think I mentioned this morning, uh, removed the veil, uh, the, uh, the scales have fallen and it's revealed the evil nature of our hearts more readily, more, with more rapidity, with more intensity, and exacerbated all, all those things more than, than we did a long time ago. Yeah, I think the answer is yes, that the internet does sort of amplify all of those things, uh, the good and the bad. Yeah. And I guess I would ask, what, well, what would be the alternative to to just not have this because uh, there are all kinds of uh, goods that come from giving everybody a voice, everybody a platform. Um, and if we wanted to go back to the days where the only way to express your opinion was to get lucky enough to get published in the letters, letters to the editor um, or to the call-in show or something. And so, I don't know, but maybe, maybe that's just the price we pay, that yes, this is a good thing. It's not an unqualified good thing, but maybe it's good enough. Yeah, I, part of it might be, uh, depending on your worldview, whether you believe that man is basically good or evil. Yeah. 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 I think uh, what you're referring to here as well is this uh, thing known, that's becoming known as the progressive myth, uh, this I, or the myth of progress. So yeah. not progressive in the political ideology sense of the word, but just this idea of human society is on this upward and onward moral, tread. Moral yeah, it's like and this ev evolutionary moral growth. Yeah, thing. and that uh, it's progressing upward. And I think that might be what makes uh, what we see online seem so um, horrible for us. Uh, it's hard to accept just like you say, see that veil torn away. It's hard to accept that because that causes this massive amount of cognitive dissonance if your worldview includes this idea of a basically good humanity, or I would say even more than that, a basically good humanity that is constantly moving onwards and upwards in its um, moral goodness and sense of virtue. So I do think that there is a um, there is a degree of collective humiliation in seeing this, um, and a sense of mm. you can't do anything to stop it. It it cuts against um, some deeply deeply held beliefs about humanity and um, you know where society should be going uh, or what people believe uh, the direction society should for, be going for in. the Christian it should just be the best form of apologetics that we can imagine is all oh, yeah. showing us how how f failed man is uh, my newspaper collection here this is part of it for our mm -hmm. viewers at home almost every single one of these deals with conflict sadness, tragedy, mm -hmm. um, and it's memorialized in, in this particular day's paper. Yes, Matthew was mocking me earlier, but the fact that the ink dried on the day that Nixon's funeral in my hometown of Yorba Linda, California happened. Here's a positive one, yeah, that, a good one. that one of the Apollo missions Matthew, I don't have my glasses on. Which one is it? Is it 10-ish? Uh, Eagle in orbit or for the that, first time. Oh, that, that's, that's when they landed. So yeah. that's, yeah, yeah, that's this 11. This must be Apollo 11. Yeah. yeah. So this no, Aldrin, Edwin Aldrin. Edwin Aldrin. Aldrin and, uh, yeah, well, uh, Aldrin and, and Armstrong and yeah. July of 1969, yeah. you'll find yeah. it. So I remember exactly where I was watching this on TV, which was a technical, talk about a technological miracle. Yeah. You weren't around. 
No way. I no. Wasn't either, actually. <laughs> but I will so celebrate that moment with you because it's still cool. <laughs> well, you guys, you don't even deserve to sit at this table. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go. What were you going to say earlier? I was going to say it's interesting because these are artifacts here. In a sense that a lot of the online things we've been talking about, all of the online commentary back and forth aren't physically no. artifacts. Oh, that's exactly And they, and they may disappear into the yep. ether. I mean, it's searchable. Or they're in a weird resized, way. you know, you can print it out or whatever. Yeah. This is the actual record. So it may be it's like a scroll. That, that as much as we have this um, sort of bad way of talking with each other, the vitriol and all that type oh, of stuff. Maybe that's might, a good thing. It might disappear into the ether <laughs> in a way that it wouldn't if you had printed yeah. it in a newspaper. I don't you, know, though. John raises a good point, too, in recognizing kind of what has driven the newspaper model, at least uh, for, the, for a long time anyway, and this idea of, I guess, um, recording human tragedy. And, and uh, I think um, that could also be a big function of the language and vitriol we see in these online spaces is the fact that that's what people are usually commenting on. You're already talking about conflict and tragedy, which engages some pretty strong negative emotions. And so that's your starting point of conversation. So I kind of wonder, not that this will happen, but it would be interesting. Uh, what if a big site like Facebook just eliminated the opportunity to share links, stories. Couldn't do it. Can't share news. Can you make comments? But see, that's the thing. You can make comments, but if someone's post just posting a text-based comment saying, God, I can't stand this situation, what's that gonna what's that gonna do? You don't have an article or a headline with a picture that people can use as a reference point. So people who are in the know might say, like, what are you talking about? Well, and you would actually end up with a, maybe an argument, but be still be a discussion. I would imagine some of the first comments would be somewhere along the line of, wait, what happened? <laughs> and all of a sudden, you start with questions and not just these visceral reactions. Mm. Um, mm. Interesting. Yeah. It but, makes me wonder if, if I post an article, if anybody ever reads it. No, I was going to say it might functionally be like that already because somebody posts an article and all you see is the headline and nobody reads it and they start commenting based on what they think it said. Yeah. So That's why I think some of these social sharing apps like Buffer App, I actually like using that because I can actually see who interacts with the articles I post. So, uh, and, it, and people do click on it even if they don't make comments. But I'm hoping for that anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just a thought that, that when, you, when your starting point for conversation is conflict and tragedy, why are we surprised when there are these types of reactions and conversations when the vitriol just explodes. I mean, I don't know if we should be surprised at that point. I think they're, I think it's, it, it's creating, as uh, Tim Muehlhoff talks about, and I beg to differ, uh, a toxic communication climate. And so I think that's where we can step in um, as Christians, and especially, this should not surprise us as Christians, I think, when we do believe in something like sin nature and the um, aspects of sin uh, that affect our speech and affect our language and interactions with one another. I think when we step into that, we can step in more wisely into these forums, recognizing that this has a very high potential to become a toxic uh, communication climate. And that requires a great deal of wisdom. And, and self-restraint. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and I think that's something we ha actually have the tools, if we take the time to talk about them, develop them, work on them in our discipleship, and speak about it in our churches, we have actually the tools and the philosophical framework in which we can actually mm. speak into that phenomena rather than just sit back and, as the author to this letter to the editor, uh, does just kind of riff on complaining on mm. the internet as a major cause of social harm. I mean, it can, we can actually say, no, 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 we can, we can actually amplify the good because our framework includes this mess, but can still see how to use it for good purposes. But man, that takes energy. It does, hard work. it does, and it is yeah. hard work. But it's good work. How so? How does it take energy and hard work? Because it goes against our natural inclinations to just react in the moment and to actually well, sit and think and be. Especially when the platform's built for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, love, po love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, mm -hmm. you know. Controlling mm -hmm. our tongue uh, James 3, pretty mm -hmm. much impossible, but mm -hmm. so is, you know, our ability to type, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, which the is, thing. they're connected. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Again, going back to this idea that all oh, the internet's to blame. It's kind of mm. like, well, the platforms were very different over the course of these uh, years, and we have to recognize that it's an ongoing of ongoing concern, and that's why I think talking about issues of citizenship are a bigger mm -hmm. issue yeah. not than, uh, than technology is, because technology will always change, our interaction with it will always change. What doesn't change is our humanity, and that's what questions of citizenship gets to, is the character of our humanity mm -hmm. and how that's transmitted over time, and I think that's um, I think that's where it becomes the bigger question. I think that's just one thing we can take away from the internet and social media, is that as communities that live in different parts of the country have different issues at play but interact with each other instantaneously, rub, uh, rub shoulders, um, they're, uh, you know, irritate one another, etc., uh, we might have to have that definitional conversation of what does civil discourse look like because civil discourse in Arkansas might look very different than civil discourse in Los Angeles. Um, not to say that it has, this, it has the same end and goal that people can live together in community and disagree respectfully. And so, I mean, you can describe it in similar terms, but how that's actually done communicatively might look very different. Uh, and so I think we need to take some time to actually understand those nuances, even as we try to define the broad concept.